Let's go. Let's go. How nice to have you on the wine show. Well, here we are. How lovely. You've had nearly everybody else on this show. I'm so sorry. I, I, I've been so involved in my garden in Somerset that uh, I, I've barely looked up from it. And I've barely made any phone calls or any emails. I've been a disaster. Not at all. You've been enjoying the... Look at you. You're rugged. You're I outdoorsy. Have, I have gone a bit feral. I, have, can't, I can't let my hair out of the hat. It's a total disaster. I'm too vain for that. So it's stayed in here. I, I practically sleep in this hat. Now, I've always had Goody as the slightly vain one because he frequently, if, if he's not perfect... Well, he loves a hat. Mm. Although, because he's got very short hair now, because he, he, cut, his, he <laughs> cut his hair, I think, with the dog clippers. Because... <laughs> It was slightly disastrous right at the beginning. Yes. Um, but um, but now nah, it's what a thick head of hair the lovely young man's got. Lush. It's lush. I've sent you some wines across to your house. <laughs> Dozens of them. Well, we like to have a theme, obviously, and yes. uh, a couple of people had been, have been revisiting uh, Rome, your HBO series, where you're. Have they? Yes, and they've been saying well, on lockdown. They, you know, after four months, they've really had to delve back into the archives, haven't they? <laughs> oh, they've loved it. They've gone right back. And they said, they've said to me, oh, well, we've been enjoying Rome, and what we've really enjoyed is going back. And it got me thinking, why don't we go and do a sort of Mark Antony tour of Gaul? Get out of here! With the wine. That is a brilliant idea. Are you telling me that all of these wines are wines that. Have come from the Rubicon. Or well, yes, but place. they all have some sort of connection, particularly with the conquest of Gaul. Uh, and in fact, yeah. the first one that I want you to open, have you got the Arbois Jura? And it says Jura across the front. So it's, it's a white wine, sort of. This one, this Sauvignon. That's the one, yes, Arbois Sauvignon. Savignin from Jean Louis. Oh, it's from. Oh, I see. That's where it's from. Up there, it is a little map on the back, dear viewer, that would help. Oh, yeah. For an idiot like me, can you see? Just I there? can see it there. Yes. Yeah. And what did um, Mark Antony do in Jura? <laughs> There's a big statue, I think. What? What didn't he do? Have they got a statue of him? They have, I think. They have. And isn't it because, and I can't pronounce his name and I've tried really hard, um, Verkin Tigorex. Well, we, you say Verkin. I, as far as I always thought, it was Versin. Oh, Versin Tigorex. And Versin Tiger, Tigorex. Versin Tigorex. You want to thought that I spent... As far as I'm aware, yeah. Big, in the show, big hairy dude. Big hairy dude. Well, Mark Antony defeated... Versintigerex. Versintigerex. Um Just near where this wine comes from. But as you're opening it, I'll give you a little more detail because... Of course he did. He whipped his ass. Do you know that Mark Antony, fun fact, invented the concept of decimation? And decimation literally means to decimate, which means to chop off every tenth head. This was used for his own troops. That if his own troops weren't brave enough, every tenth man was beheaded. Brutal. That is quite what something. A treat. Um, Whoa! What's this? Have a swift. Oh come on! This is sherry. It's not quite. It's not quite. So the reason I got this, there are two bits. This is the closest thing we're going to get to the wine that Mark Antony will have actually toasted that battle. Um, this is um, Sauvignon, not to be confused with Sauvignon, they're totally different. And Sauvignon, there was some analysis of its DNA recently, and it has not changed. It is the same grape that he will have enjoyed 2,000 years ago. No. So most grapes have changed quite a lot, but Sauvignon is a genuinely ancient one, and it's really not Why changed. Why is that? Is that because they've just never uh, pulled up the vines? Have they never... <laughs> have they... I mean... <laughs> well, it's what? more... It's a sort of bit of a, it? it's a bit of, I think it's a bit of two things. It's a bit of a backwater and so people have just left vines. So some vines have been you know, fiddled around with, but some of these older areas, people have just kept planting the same thing time and time again. And it's in this rather oxidative style, because you said it's sort of like sherry. Well, yeah, I mean, it's remarkably like sherry. I'll just, take, I'll just take a whack, it's early, but I'll take a whack. Oh, no, you know, we, we're all at home. Mm. It's, it's not as bone dry, and it's certainly not as fortified as sherry, because this is regular 
Right. Okay. So why is there such similarity between this and sherry? Because um, sherry is an oxidative style of wine, so it's matured and it has this contact with oxygen over a period of time. They do make a style of wine from Sauvignon, Sauvignon in Jura called Vin Jaune, because it goes very yellow. Okay. Now that is aged for, I think, six years in a very similar way, under this layer of floor, this yeasty cap that sits on the, the wine, kind of protects it. There is, you can make Sauvignon one of three ways. You can make it like Vin Jaune. You can make it in a very fresh style, which is rather like key lime pie. It has the sort of creamy, oh, yeah. meringue, limey character. And this is a bit in between. So this has maybe had a couple of years of this aging, and then they've drawn it off so it's not gone full sherry. It's just, because when you have a sniff, it's still fruity. It's still got that limey zest. It's just mm -hmm. overlaid. It's not completely salty cheesy, if you like. No, 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 sure. But what is it about this grape in particular that makes it like sherry? Well, not all grapes are particularly suited to this style of winemaking, because a lot of them just go bad and they just can't right. stick up for it. This has really lovely zestiness to it, so it's quite a high acid wine. If we do the dribble test where you take a mouth and then you sort of knock your head forward and you see how dribbly your sides of your tongue get. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. You run it upside down and then I can hardly mm. talk now because it's sort of, that's because it's got very high acidity to it, which makes a brilliant foodie wine. And these wines all come from Yap, and the team at Yap was Bianca. Hello, Bianca from Yap. Oh, I love Yap. On your way down the 303, you often see they have a really lovely old Citroen van. They do. They do. Um, in fact, I'm... Which they would often park up in a lay-by just outside here. Oh, yeah, I've got it um, here. As a piece of um, as a piece of advertising or publicity to I show people. Have the that's what, there it is. So there it is. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. That is the Yap van. So yeah, yeah. The, the lovely team there, they only bring in about 100 bottles of this. And I said to them, who do you sell this to? And they said, well, we only bring about 100 bottles. It all goes to sommeliers. So sommeliers buy this because it's a really good foodie wine. And that key in acidity in the oxidative style makes it quite challenging when you first try it. But with food, mm. later on, I had this with um, a sort of tarragon chicken dish last week. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. Now the whole thing worked really well. But on its own, you sort of go, oh, I don't know. You know, it's a little bit... Punchy no, there. I'd have this on a Sunday morning instead of a bottle of sherry. I mean, not, not that I would drink a whole bottle of sherry before Sunday lunch, but um, kind of depending. Can I'll you drink. promise us you've but never drunk? I drink a bottle of this before Sunday lunch. Are, are there occasions like when you have drunk this before Sunday lunch? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Right, what else do yeah. we have here? Um, next wine, let's have a go. Yes. I've it. got. You've got, you should have um, a red down yes. there. I'm going to tell everybody a about a couple of other bits whilst you get it. You've got a Syrah, but um, have a go at the Costier de Nîmes Chateau Rubo Rouge. Oh, yeah, okay, got it. Yep, fine. Mm. 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 Turning into quite a day. <laughs> this is going to be a fun day today. Whilst you're rubbing um, them up, if anybody is looking around at Yap, I'm going to go and show you a couple of other ones. There's Cremant de Jura. This is a real gem of a wine. You know Dolly Alderton, she who wrote some, everything I know about love, and she's the yes. Sunday Times um, agony aunt columnist. She said that they were drinking Cremant, which is two pounds cheaper and nicer, and it's what you drink when you, you turn thirty. That's gorgeous stuff made from Chardonnay. And the other side, it's not a million miles away. Cancy, which is a sort of lighter weight more delicate take on yes, yes. Sancerre. So this one, where is this one exactly from? The red that you've got there. Yeah. So we're now going to go down to the South France to the Costier de Nîmes. Okay. Costier de Nîmes Chateau Rubo Rouge. And the Costier de Nîmes, the reason I chose yeah. this is the the logo, what's the logo, the sort of symbol of the Costier de Nîmes, you sometimes get it on wine bottles, is palm trees and crocodiles. Because of all the Roman legion, legion, legionaries, who came back from North Africa and from the Nile. And they had seen these weird things like palm trees and um, yeah. and crocodiles. So it became the symbol of Costier de Nîmes, which is where this wine comes from. This is from Way the- Way back then? They, 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 well, I mean, now in France, you've had several migrations because not only did the uh, legionnaires, is it legionnaires, legionaries? Legion yeah, yeah. Legionary. Troops, 
Troops. Yeah. <laughs> they came back, and then actually, more recently, Costa de was one of those areas where um, lots of French um, soldiers who'd been in Tunisia and North Africa, uh, when French France was a sort of you know, occupying colonial force, they also returned and they came back and made wine. I think they were known as Les Pieds Noirs, the Blackfeet, who came back. And they, okay. um, so they, it's been a successive generations of people have come back. So, tell mm. me about this. What nice smell there? Oh, juicy herbal. Do you get there's a sort of garigi feel to it? Mm. This is one of those wines that you can put in the fridge for a bit. Tell me something, because something I've been meaning to ask you, and people ask me to ask you, is they say, I don't understand. How is it that wines can taste of all these different things? How is it wine can taste of wet cement or wet stone, I read recently, or pepper, or uh, you know tobacco? or How is it that it can do this? And somebody said, do they add those tastes? <laughs> This is a very good question. I, somebody asked me this yesterday. They said, so have they put some blackcurrant in it? Said, no. Yes. The, the, the one thing is none of those things are added. The only thing you could say is, if you like, added as a flavour is oakiness because you put it in a barrel and it barrel. assumes that oaky character. And that's the only sort of outside influence, really, where something gets added in. The rest of it all comes from the grape and the yeast that ferments it. Mm -hmm. And... I know I'm going to offend people who really love beer and cider and things, but there is something quite magical about grapes and their ability to produce this panoply, a universe of aromas and flavours that no other fruit or grain is able to do. I mean, I'm not, you know, whiskey is able to produce an amazing array of different characteristics from different places. Mm -hmm. And I know that apples, can, you know, make different ciders in the West Country that they do in, you know, Norfolk sure. or France. But wine and the grape is able to go and make a slightly different thing on that side of the road to that side of the road and there'll be sure, something yeah. in the soil or you making it and me making it and it can be an expression of the way we are and then will there be consistency for the wine on that side of the road that has a peppery let's say mm. for the sake of argument and on the other side of the road all those vines don't Completely. This there's a blend of grapes in this. This is mostly Grenache and a little bit of Syrah, and there'll be some other things in it. That same blend of grapes will taste slightly different if you go to Fougere or Corbière, and it'll be again slightly different when you go further up into the Rhone Valley and you get into mm -hmm. sort of Rhone. Only grapes seem to be able to go and do this, and they have those expressions. Isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it really is extraordinary considering how many fruits there are in the world. Yes. And yet this one has the ability to behave like a chameleon and change its tune. And and I think that sometimes, well, it's like, an, it's like you. It has this ability to assume another personality. Remarkable indeed. <laughs> and we can transport it to a different territory. Oh, well, crack it, I'm going away with this now. We can transport it, let's say, to Mexico City. Oh, yes. And with a little bit of training, a different vinyl system. A little bit of help. A little bit of help. Become a CIA agent who speaks fluent Spanish. I know. I've got something to tell you about that. Oh, go um, on. I, I know you were, because I knew last time we met, I knew you were doing um, Swedish. I was. On this amazing app called Duolingo. Mm. Yeah. So I had to learn Spanish for that job, for this job that's coming up. It comes out uh, for viewers at home on July the 17th on Amazon Prime and it's called El Candidato and El Candidato is a TV show for uh, Amazon Prime and it's a, about um, a couple of CIA agents who are convinced that the mayor of Mexico City might be a sleeper agent for the cartels and uh, I was asked to do it and they said can you speak Spanish and of course I did that act I think again well I can speak a bit of French a bit of Italian how hard can it be to learn Spanish? Well, it turns out pretty hard, actually. Um, much harder than I had imagined. And I had maybe, I don't know, six weeks, or six, maybe a month, six weeks before I started shooting. So I thought I'll get, I'll, I'll learn various ways. And one of the ways I'll do it is by walking and working out and running, listening to and doing Duolingo. And on Duolingo, they have a leaderboard mm -hmm. on Duolingo, of worldwide leaderboard of who has got the most points of any given day, considering how much work they put in. And for a period of about three weeks, I was world number one on Duolingo for learning Mexican Spanish. It just means 
how much time you've put in and how many of the tests you've completed. But for a period of time, I was able to show my showrunner that I was number one in the world. I think this is, that is more than enough of achievement. I bet you're better than Dos Cervezas, por favor. And that's all I knew when I went. So you started... When I first, when I got the job, I literally had four words. Dos Cervezas, por favor. That's um, extraordinary. And if you're doing it in Castilian Spanish, it's Dos Cervezas, por, por favor. But if you're doing it in Mexican Spanish, you don't do the th on the s. Which is, isn't it right that that was, it came because there was um, a prince who lisped and so that he wasn't... Oh, well, that would absolutely make sense, yeah. And it was to not like embarrass him. country with our slightly Germanic upper classes, yeah. they all had to, had to start copying the royal family when they were all um, when they were all German. Yes. And so there was a very slight uh, German accent given to the English upper classes, or you can trace it back. Various, you know, linguistic etymologists have worked out that if you go backwards, that, that was when we had started speaking in a very in a very specific way was because when the aristocracy had the coffee wing. That's a rather clips received pronunciation. How interesting. Mm. Should we try the last one? We've got a uh, Syrah. So if you could dig around yes. for your Syrah. Um, now, this one. Yes, IGP Colline Rodanienne, Domaine Georges Verne. It's actually made by Christine Verne. Um, mm -hmm. And this is a bit of a gem. This is a single variety Syrah from the Northern Rhone. And you know you're mentioning pepper. Are you getting a bit of pepper? I'm getting a strong sense of pepper, but right behind that, tarmac. Mm. Is that right? Mm. Pitch. Pitch. You're good, because that's why it's Roman. Because Pliny, the writer, yeah. he knew Syrah as a great variety. It's another ancient great variety. And he called it Pictatum. And he said it was because it was like pitch, where we get the word pitch from, kind of tarry. No way. So this smells of pepper and... Was that Pliny the Elder? It was Pliny the Elder, yes. I'm pretty certain it was the Elder. Yes. Um, and the younger was a wastrel. He was. And he wrote quite yeah. a lot about wine, did Pliny. Um, that is amazing. Does this, does this change over time? It does. I also get um, slightly 1970s joysticks and bacon. <laughs> what, a little bit of patchouli in there? Yeah. If, uh, some people will I be tasting along with yeah. To everybody who's tasting along with this, how about going to your blast? Because I know some people, they went to Wendy, bought the wines. It's great. And um, are you getting patchouli on? Do you, does this smell slightly of a 1980s goth? Yeah, I used to have an Afghan coat that smelled like this. Hmm. You get it? Yeah. Yeah. If anybody what's used to... strange about it, actually, you don't taste pitch when you drink it. No. It's beautiful dry currants and... And there is actually a peppery mm, character yeah, yeah. on the palate, but it's that Yeah, right at the back of the mouth. Mm. On the edges. Crikey, I can't believe I'm tasting wine and remembering Affleck's Palace in Manchester where people used to go and buy mad old coats. Like that. <laughs> There'd be a few people going, oh, I remember Affleck's Palace. Yeah, legendary place. Go and buy coats. That is, that is remarkable. It's lovely. So you only get the Northern Rhone, which is seriously classy, is about 5% of what the Rhone makes. 95% of it all comes from the south. So to go and find a wine that's effectively a Cote Rhone, IGP, Colina Rodinian, but from the north, is not mad money, but it's a way of enjoying that clarity and the precision and the... The single variety Cyrenus of Northern Rome without going and breaking the bank, which I love. Sure. And uh, has this changed much since old Mark Antony's day? Dramatically, yes. Uh, I think that winemaking is much cleaner and clearer. And I mean, bear in mind, I was doing some work on rose. Rose's changed dramatically. People don't harvest it before a long lunch. So I think historically, you know, winemakers are like, get it in, have a bit of lunch, come back, kind of make the wine. Even in the last 25 years, 30 years, we now you know you harvest grapes at three o'clock in the morning and you don't have a long lunch and you put dry ice over them to keep them nice and fresh. And that sort of thing. So wine was probably muddier and dirtier that, that Mark Antony enjoyed. Um, now yeah, I mean, he uh, was famous he, uh, for his vomiting. He, um, he was a terrible vomiter. And he, had, he paid a senator who would sit next to him in the Senate House to hold out his toga I, in a kind of bowl-like effect yeah. so that Mark Anthony could throw up in it whenever he fancied. 
It's a mid speech. <laughs> just. It, it was like, it was it Billy Connolly really did the great stuff. But it, most days he would have a hangover, and most days he would uh, he would use this chap next to him to vomit into his toga. You know, Mark, it was, um, you know, Billy Connolly did a sketch about the ability of Glaswegian um, pipe fitter welders to do a casual vomit. And they'd say, sort of, and then they'll just sort of carry on and talking. Just carry on. I think that's precisely it. It's a casual vomit. It's a casual vomit, I, but I really, in ancient Rome. <laughs> I love the idea of a casual vomit. It's one that nobody really mentions. Yeah, it's or, just, or, yeah. or comments on. Totally. Thank you so much for joining in. In your beautiful home, you've got your oh, office. Thank you. Thank you. Bookshelf yeah, credibility. I, I wasn't. I, I we. I built this last year. It's not a. Uh, it's a, 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 suddenly everybody started calling it a man cave. I just wanted an office. I just wanted lots of panes of glass between me and my children. Hmm. You know, because <laughs> I, 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 I have young children. I have twins, and, and really, I can see them in the house. Like, not now, but when they're there, I can see them. Just can't hear them. Lovely chatting with you as always. We'll I see you again soon. I don't to you enough about these things. I would love to talk to you again. We'll do, we'll do it again. Um, maybe we could do this. I'm going back down to Somerset next week, so maybe we could do one live from the veg patch if you fancy that. Let's do one live from the veg patch. And what do you want to try next time? Claret and... I want you to talk me through claret, and I want to know... I can buy a Vermentino for 14 quid, in, or maybe even less for Waitrose, but I can also get one that's 30 quid. What's the difference? I'll find you two great Vermentinos. We'll do that. Right. Because I'm bit, you get put me on to Vermentinos, I'm now obsessed with them. Vermentino and Claret. We'll do yeah. that. Join in, everybody, because we've got Vermentino and Claret coming up in a couple of weeks on the One Show at Home. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant jokes. Thank you very much, indeed. See you again soon. And you. Please. Mwah.